Hello everyone and welcome to this study day arranged from the parish of Gidea Park, uh, which has as its title the evolution of the mass. It's coming up to 60 years since the Vatican Council first met in 1962. <laughs> the first major document of the council was of course the constitution on the liturgy Council Fathers were very keen to look at the liturgy and really to pick up on what already during the reign of Pope Pius XII had been done to review the liturgy, to reform the liturgy. And so 60 years on, we look at the Mass now, we are aware of various controversies going on, and I thought it would be a very good idea, particularly with the experience many people have had of live stream uh, liturgy, live stream masses, to get a view on the whole development of the mass from the earliest times. And I'm very pleased that Professor Deacon John Morrill uh, of the Diocese of East Anglia has agreed to present the evolution of the mass. We're going to be having two sessions, one now from 11 o'clock and then a break of about quarter of an hour and then the second session followed by questions. You can uh, send in your questions, you've got the details on, on the screen. So I won't take any more of John's precious time and uh, thank you all for listening whether you're and watching whether you're doing that live now or in the future and a warm welcome to John Morrill, The Evolution of the Mass. Thank you, Adrian. Lovely to be back with you. Uh, a very different subject from the last one I talked about. In fact, you always ask me to do something completely different. I want you to take us back uh, to some time in probably in the 130s. There was a man called Ju uh, Justin, and he was a Greek born in Samaria, so with all those Samaritans around him. And uh, but he was a Greek, not and a pagan, and he spent his early years. Um, going and exploring the meaning of life by talking to all the great philosophers he could find and none of them satisfied him until he found a cheerful old man who was a Christian who told him not to worry too much about what was in his head but what was in his heart what was his heart truly seeking and he came to recognize through the activity of prayer uh, the truth of the Christian religion and he then became a great apologist to the Christian religion and went to Rome and taught all he could uh, for about 30 years in Rome until uh, the other philosophers were fed up with him stealing the, the, the people who were paying good money to listen to their philosophies and they reported him to the emperor um, and he chose not to renounce his Christianity, which was still illegal in the Roman Empire, but to experience horrendous torture and death. And he's been known ever since as Justin Martyr. Now, uh, what matters about him for today is that uh, around 138, or perhaps a bit later, around that time, he gave an account of what it was like to go to Mass. And he gives us a very, very clear sense of what a Mass was like. And so if we move to the, fir the first slide um, of, uh, of my selection, these are the bullet points which you get out of Justin Martyr's account of the Mass. No one may share the Eucharist with us unless he believes what we teach is true, unless he is washed in the regenerating waters of baptism for remission of sins, and unless he lives in accordance with the principles given us by Christ. He, he, he strives to live a holy life. On Sunday, we have a common assembly of all our members. The recollections of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read. The president of the assembly speaks to us. He urges everyone to imitate the examples of virtue we've heard in the readings. Then we all stand up together and pray. On the conclusion of our prayer, bread and wine and water are brought forward. And the next slide, the wealthy, if they wish, may make a contribution and they themselves decide the amount. The collection is placed in the custody of the president who uses it to help the orphans and widows and all who for any reason in distress. 
The president offers prayers and gives thanks to the best of his ability and the people give assent by saying, Amen. The Eucharist is distributed, everyone present, everyone present communicates. The deacons take it to those who are absent. What's missing from that from what we do nowadays? What, uh, already a hundred years after Jesus' death, the shape of the mass is very, very clear and very settled. And what we're going to look at is the ways in which that has been developed and constantly rethought over the 1900 years since. But essentially, the shape of the mass is there. Um, and we know that there's already people meeting every week to, uh, to remember the Last Supper, to remember Jesus' promise to be always with us uh, when we said uh, the prayers of the Last Supper. Uh, we know that from St Paul's epistle, but this is the first time we see the shape of the liturgy um, emerging very clearly, I uh, say within 100 years or just over 100 years after Jesus died. So if we now jump forward to the 1960s and look what the church in its great wisdom said in December 1963, and as Adrian said, the first of the uh, constitutions, I say the actually foundational documents for the Second Vatican Council, uh, mm -hmm. Sacrosanctum Concilium, this most holy um, uh, council, let me say straight away, because because of some of the naysayers about the liturgy um, are un, unenthusiastic about reminding you of this, the vote on Sacrosanctum Concilium uh, was 2,147 votes to four. There were only four dissidents and 2,147 bishops thought that this was an important reform. Liturgical renewal was at the centre of Vatican II. If you look at the documents um, of the Second Vatican Council gathered together in the collections, then you'll see that almost half the documents relate to liturgy. Of the 62 papal documents that are grow out of the council, which the council invites the, the, the Pope to, uh, to develop out of the council document, 25 relate to liturgy. So liturgy and liturgical renewal is absolutely the centre, and it is the first constitution, the one they took as being the one on which there was the most need and the most consensus. And here are some highlights from it, from Article 14. Holy Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in liturgical celebrations, which is demanded by the very nature of the liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, that's from St. Peter, the letter of St. Peter, is their right and duty by virtue of their baptism. In the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered before all else, for it is the primary indispensable source from which the faithful derive the true Christian spirit, and therefore pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. 2,147 bishops thought that the liturgy should become something in which the laity were fully involved and fully understanding. Only four were uncertain. To move to the next slide, in the restoration and promotion of the sacred liturgy, this full and active participation by all the people is the aim to be considered above all else. For it is the primary and indispensable source from which the faithful to derive the true Christian spirit. Therefore, pastors of souls must zealously strive to achieve it by means of the necessary instruction in all their pastoral work. So that's just reinforcing what I said. So, in the Eucharist, in the Mass, we are not passive recipients, we are active participants, because in the Mass we are being transformed. 
and we are offering ourselves to be transformed, we are active participants, not just spectators who are spoon fed. We are actively engaged. So uh, the, I've got, a, I've got the, a noises of a, another voice. Article 21, the next slide. Holy Mother Church desires to undertake with great care a general restoration of the liturgy. For the liturgy, Paul, I think you're on sound. For the liturgy is made up of immutable elements divinely instituted and of elements subject to change. These not only may, but ought to be changed with the passage of time if they, if they have suffered from intrusion of anything out of harmony with the inner nature of the liturgy or become unsuited to it. That's a really important that there are some things which can never change. They are of its essence and the things which we, we develop, which are culturally determined. It's an important principle of the Second Vatican Council generally, but, but particularly in relation to liturgy, that there should be allowance for local cultural um, changes. Um, uh, there, there is to be subsidiarity, there's to be rights of bishops' conferences to, uh, on, uh, on some of the ways in which it's expressed, but not of its essence and core. Paul, I think I can hear you. Um, Adaptations to local circumstances is the way it's put. And of course, although the decision was made that the vernacular language should be used throughout the mass, the extent to which it should be vernacular language only um, was, to, was to be determined at a local level. Uh, that was one of the things where there was a slight caution now, amongst the documents which follow fairly rapidly on from the um, constitution of the bishops is the first of the bishops, um, uh, so the Pope's own documents, the Matu Proprio Sacram Liturgiam, January 1964, and the, from the, I hope this slide is now up. The many documents on liturgical questions that have been published and are well known to all demonstrate how it has been was the ceaseless concern of our predecessors in the Supreme Pontificate of ourselves and of the Holy Shepherds to preserve diligently to cultivate and to renew the sacred liturgy according to need to preserve to cultivate and to renew. That it was never frozen in, in time as being for all time. Some elements were frozen for all time, but much else was to be diligently preserved, cultivated and renewed. If we move on to the next document, we get from Paul VI Apostolic Constitution Missale Romanum, so the, the preface to the new missal, which was issued in 1969. And again, we listen carefully to the balance of this. For four centuries, not only has the Tridentine right, the right uh, um, introduced in the, in, the, in the 1560s, not only has it furnished the priests of the Latin right with the norms for the celebration of the Eucharistic sacrifice, but also the saintly herald of the gospel have carried it almost the entire world. So great respect is to be had for the right which had been um, a, a universally used since um, the, the 1560s. Since that time, there has grown and spread among the Christian people the liturgical renewal, which, according to Pius XII, our predecessor of venerable memory, seems to show the signs of God's providence in the present time, a salvic, salvic uh, uh, action of the Holy Spirit in the Church. This renewal has also shown clearly that the formulas of the Roman Missal ought to be revised and enriched. The beginning of this renewal was the work of our predecessor, the same Pius XII. So we've got this sense that, that, that there is much to build on, but there is much that needs to be reconsidered. Um, and that um, um, renewal is probably the key word. And so to moving to the next slide from the Missal Romanum, 
Cons the Constitution Sacrosanctum Concilium established the basis for the general revision of the Roman Missal in declaring both texts and rites should be drawn up so that they express more clearly the holy things which they signify, in ordering that the rite of the Mass is revised in such a way that the intrinsic nature and purpose of its several parts, as also the connection between them, can be more clearly manifested, and the devout and active participation by the faithful can be more easily accomplished. In prescribing the treasures of the Bible are to be opened up more lavishly so that the rich affair may be provided for the faithful at the table of God's word. In ordering, find it a new rite of concelebration is to be drawn up and incorporated. <coughs> One might ought not to think, however, that this revision of the Roman Missal has been improvident. The progress that the liturgical sciences have has accomplished in the last four centuries has without a doubt prepared the way. After the Council of Trent, the study of the ancient manuscripts of the Vatican Library and others gathered elsewhere has provided a basis for, um, for reflection on how the, 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 the centrality of the Mass in the lives of all the faithful is to be achieved. So I'm, I'm going to finish all this, this reading in a minute and, and, and get on something um, uh, perhaps a bit richer, but there's a few more things on how this is to be achieved, both by the um, council itself and by the Pope's uh, action, by, by, uh, by the um, advice and consent of the council, moving on to the, the examples of enrichment and simplification in the next slide. So first, enrichment. The major innovation concerns the Eucharistic prayer. If in the Roman rite, the first part of this prayer, the preface has preserved diverse formularies in the course of the centuries, the second part, the canon of the action, took on an unchangeable form during the fourth and fifth centuries. Conversely, Eastern liturgies allow for this, for this variety in their anaphoras, that's say in the, in the stories of the, uh, the institution of the Eucharist the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. In this matter, however, apart from the fact that the Eucharistic prayer is enriched by a great number of prefaces, either derived from the ancient tradition of the Roman Church or composed recently, we've decided to add three new canons to this prayer. In this way, the different aspects of the mystery of salvation will be emphasised and they will procure richer themes for the thanksgiving. And we'll look in some detail in the second session at the introduction of the four principal um, Eucharistic prayers and not simply the Roman canon or Eucharistic prayer one. So on simplification, in the next slide, Concerning the right of the mass, the rites are to be simplified while due care is to be taken to preserve their substance. Also to be eliminated are elements which with the passage of time came to be duplicated or added with little but, uh, but little advantage. Above all in the rites of offering bread and wine and in those of the breaking of the bread and of communion. And on the final, the final slide of this group, oh no, uh, yeah. Other elements which have suffered injury through accidents of history are now to be restored to the earlier norm of the Holy Fathers. For example, the homily, the common prayer or prayer of the faithful, the penitential rite or act of reconciliation with God and with the brothers at the beginning of the Mass where its proper emphasis is restored. We'll come back to that again in some detail in the second lecture. But this important principle that over the centuries things have been lost as well as things have been consolidated. Right, that's the end of the sort of exegesis of what the Second Vatican Council uh, taught us. And um, I will summarise that all again at the beginning of the second lecture of what the main elements are that went into the creation of the, the um, new missal. The contested elements at the time and since are the principle of concelebration, which has come up again very recently. Concelebration where priests demonstrate their unity around the table of the Lord rather than saying separate uh, masses and different altars simultaneously. The reception and communion under both kinds, the reception of the chalice as well as of the, uh, um, of the body of Christ, the blood of Christ, um, dropped in the about the 11th and 12th century 
um, mainly, I think, because uh, of worry that, um, that beer, that if you take the blood of Christ, you can get into your beard if you're a man, or even get, get dropped. Um, restored by the Protestants, and because it was restored by the Protestants, resisted by the church in the 16th century. Uh, but always, always a sort of compromise that was unhappy because Christ didn't share um, his body. He shared his body and blood. Communion in the hand. Um, as, uh, that has remained a controversial area. The commissioning of, of lay ministers of Holy Communion to help with distribution of Holy Communion, both at the mass and um, in care homes and in amongst the housebound and the presence of female acolytes and lectors on the altar. Now, some of those were, uh, were approved uh, in papal documents after the Second Vatican Council. Uh, others took a long time and were part of the process by which my bishops took, um, their, their, took, their, took the authority they had as bishops' conferences to decide what was right you know, for, for their own people. And we might come back to some of those later on. I'm just drawing attention to them at the moment. So we move to the next slide called the shape of the liturgy. There are, there are several ways in which we can um, define the two parts of the mass because it's clear that the mass is in two parts. And the early church is called the mass of the catechumens, that's say the mass of for that, the part which is attended by those who are not yet baptized. Um, and they have to leave at the end of the, of the if you like, uh, of the first half. And then the mass of the faithful, when the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. Another way of putting the same thing is the liturgy of the word leading to the liturgy of the Eucharist. Uh, the preparation, uh, preparation of ourselves by, uh, by recognizing our uh, unworthiness to be in the presence of the Lord and our preparation by receiving and being nourished by the word of God and then having been prepared then participating in the sacrifice of the mass um, and asking to be transformed as the bread and wine are transformed and in all cases in all cases, the hinge um, between the, the liturgy of the word, the liturgy of the Eucharist, preparation, participation. In every case, the hinge is the offertory. And in the last part of this, uh, of this first talk, I want to look in some detail at the history of the offertory. But just before doing that, something which I think I meant to do and which I've got sort of um, got sidelined as I, as I went through, I'll just go back and make one point. The true significance of the, um, uh, the reform at the, at the Council of Trent, the Tridentine Rite, what's now known as the Extraordinary Form, um, the true significance was that for the first time, it, for the first time and only time, it gave the church one text of the mass to be used in all times and in all places. From the time of Justin Martyr to the time of 1560, um, there were huge varieties in the way in which mass was celebrated. All the elements, all the elements in Justin Martyr's account are preserved but many of the as as the as the the, the improvisation as the um the right of the presiding minister to put his own words into for example into the canon as they became formalized and as formal prayers became more and more present the pattern is very different from country to country and it's very different from um uh, religious order to religious order. So the, the, the Dominicans um, have their own right. Um, countries have their own right. In England, there was a right which was developed um, in the late Anglo-Saxon period into the Norman period at the, uh, in Salisbury, and is known, uh, Salisbury is commonly known as Sarum, 
and and the serum right was, became the one that was most commonly but not universally used in England and actually it still has some there were some prayers in it which disappeared from the Roman right but actually remained in the Anglican right when the Anglicans translated their, their Latin they kept some of the most beautiful prayers any of you who like me I was a, I was received into the Catholic Church in 1977 before that I was an Anglican and one of the things which I loved about the, the, the Anglican liturgy um, was the prayer which he said just before the reception of Holy Communion. Uh, and it is a most beautiful prayer in the most beautiful Cranmer English. We do not presume to come to this, your table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much to gather up the crumbs under your table. But you are the same Lord whose character it is always to have mercy. Grant us, grateful, gracious Lord, to uh, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. That's actually straight out of the medieval Catholic rite used in England, but not elsewhere. So it is important that for 400 years ago, um, what was um, variations on the theme of Justin Martyr's uh, mass uh, was, was present. And it was thought that mainly in order to contest, you know, Protestant uh, claims. Uh, to, to, to bring it down into a single united form that all can, would define Catholics against, against Protestants. And therefore, to me, at any rate, there is no problem in saying that the order which was brought in the 16th century is a good thing, but that order didn't say we have now reached a point where no further no, no further thinking, no further reflection, no more, no further biblical study, no more theology can, can allow us to make it even better. And that's what happened, I think, in the last 60 years. Right, now let's go and back. And um, in the second lecture, I'm going to go through the whole of the Mass, looking at its development, looking at the, how certain things came in, why they came in, and why they're still there, and why they've been restored importantly why they've been restored but let's just as a, as i think a particularly important part to get the themes right look at this hinge the hinge between uh, the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the eucharist you know the, they they are matching one another um at the end of the uh, towards the end of the liturgy of the word you get the elevation of the book of the gospels one of the great privileges of the deacon to elevate the book of the gospels and of course, at the height of the, of the liturgy of the Eucharist, the elevation of the Ziborium and the chalice of the body and blood of Christ. They're both important, but as in any procession, what comes at the back is the most important. So the, the second is more important than the first, but the first is very important and has its own climax, the point at which we encounter the word of Jesus Christ himself. But then we go into the um, we go into the uh, uh, offertory, um, and um, so I think we move Paul. Well, no, let's just. So, what happens in the offertory? We have an offering of bread. We have a mixing of water and wine. We have offering of wine, we have the labarbo washing of hands, and then we have an exchange, a dialogue between the priest and the people. And those things I'm going to look at for the next 15 minutes. So, Paul, if we move on to the next set one, beginning the text of the offertory one. During the offertory song, the faithful usually express their participation by making an offering 
bringing forward bread and wine for the celebration of the Eucharist and perhaps other gifts to relieve the needs of the church and of the poor. And over the, when the bread arrives, the priest um, holds the, the, the bread um, above the altar and says, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness, we have received the bread we offer you, fruit of the work, earth and work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. The words come, are adapted from words at the Jewish family meal, the cheruba, uh, their words in which the bread, which is the gift of God, is offered, offered up our recognition of what he has given us. Those, but look at those words. The bread we offer you is fruit of the earth and work of human hands. God gives us um, in nature wheat barley gives us gives gives us grain what human beings do with grain is absolutely amazing we convert grain ears of grain into bread but we're going to ask god to do something far greater with it than we can do for ourselves we have done a remarkable thing with wheat but god has done can do something much more remarkable and it can become the body of Christ. It will become for us the bread of life, the bread of eternal life. A Jewish prayer transformed by the action of Jesus Christ at the Last Supper. On to the next one, please, Paul. Or the deacon or the priest pours wine and a little water into the chalice. By the mystery of this water and wine, may we become to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Uh, the mixing of water and wine is the Jewish custom. The Jewish custom of the time of Jesus was always to have um, diluted wine so in some sense we're just repeating what Jesus himself did at the last supper but of course it's also a memorial of what Christ suffered for us that at the moment of his death when the uh, when the soldier pierced his side there ran out blood and water so it's anticipating what will happen in the Eucharistic sacrifice. Um, and then taking the chalice and holding it slightly raised above the altar with both hands, the priest says in a low voice, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become our spiritual drink. Once more, it's extraordinary, isn't it? An absolutely staggering sign of, of human uh, use of the gifts of God. Uh, we use it, our gifts to convert the grape into wine. It's an astonishing tribute to human ingenuity over the millennia. What God can do with it, of course, is far greater than we can do for ourselves. So in, in this, we are saying, let us offer you, Lord, whatever we can, but you can do so much more with it. Because he's going to do that for us to have, um, uh, to share in the divinity of Christ, for us to have spiritual drink. Because he is going to transform everything that is offered to him in the Mass. We also bring up um, the, the, the collecting baskets. Now, now that is um, offering from our, from our own superfluity. Whatever we offer him, he will do more with than we can do for ourselves. It's a rather pale um, 
restoration of something that was very, very important in the early church. Do you remember with uh, Justin Martyr at the beginning saying that people give as much as they can and uh, what is not consumed during the, in the form of bread and wine during the um, Eucharist is distributed to all those in need. Incidentally, uh, Justin Martin is very clear that the deacons take it to all who are in need, not all the Catholics who are in need, but all who are in need. The whole, the whole feed the world. Now, it took several centuries. What used to happen in the early church, or we, from the accounts we have mainly of, of, of cathedrals, where bishops, around bishops, uh, that we don't have a great deal of evidence uh, other than uh, amongst the, the great leaders. But in the church that we know about, a, a large amounts of food and wine were brought up. And the seven deacons that every bishop had would be sorting out that which would be would, would be consecrated for the for the mass, and the other things would on side tables to be distributed to all in need afterwards. Gradually, that is transformed, but not probably until about the eighth century is transformed into cash, and cash is used to buy the things for for others. Um, but the idea is that we're offering of ourselves because God will transform whatever we offer him. And what's, what is important in the Mass is that whatever we offer of ourselves, he will transform. He will transform the bread and wine that we have done, that, which we have created into his own body and blood. And in coming um, as, um, as the risen and glorified Christ, calling us to divine life. When we share that with him, he will transform whatever we offer. So if when we come in the mass, in communion, and offer a little tiny bit of ourselves, he can and will transform a little bit of ourselves. If we offer the whole of ourselves to be transformed, he will transform that in the same way that he can transform bread and wine into his divine nature he can transform us into being living the living presence of, him, of himself in the world so the offertory is really important in getting us to understand that having prepared ourselves in the first half of the mass by acknowledging um, our, our frailties, by hearing and receiving and being nourished by the word of God, we now bring all that we have in order that he can transform us. Transform us, uh, um, not by pouring it as we lie inert down our throats, but insofar as we are actively involved in the action of the mass. And this is, if we move on to the next, um, is that the last slide? One more. And then, um, if I, if I, if I, I've, I've got disarranged my papers. Right, um, I'll, have to do, I'll do this without a slide then. After the priest has ritually cleansed his hands, his own unworthiness to be getting rid of anything in himself that makes him unworthy, uh, to um, uh, perform the uh, sort of lead, lead the action of the Mass. The priest says this, pray brethren, or pray brothers and sisters, or even pray sisters and brothers, pray brethren, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Not his sacrifice, my sacrifice and yours. He presides by virtue of ordination of the sacred priesthood. He presides over our offering to God of bread, wine, and our lives. That our sacrifice might be acceptable to God, that we might be acceptable to God. And, the, and we say, the people say, may the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands for the praise and glory of his name, for our good and the good of the whole church. 
it's really important that we see that the mask is always about an individual encounter, you and me encountering the risen Christ and the community being brought together, united, the broken body of Christ, the church being united. For the glory of his name, for our good, you and me, and the good of the whole good of his holy church we're built as a community and we are individually and the tension in the mass is always between whether what is happening is a personal encounter or a community encounter it's both of course it's both of course but at different times and in different places the emphasis has, 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 has drifted one way or the other and it's clearly drifted back from being very individual centered uh, before 1960 to being very community centered. It's very important that we don't lose the balance, however. One of my um, favorite theologians writing about the mass um, says about the, the, the offertory this, the offertory is not the Eucharistic oblation or offering itself any more than the last supper. Supper was the sacrifice of Christ. That was Calvary. That was the cross. It's directed to that offering as its pledge and starting point. Just the last supper looks forward to the offering on Calvary. The offering of ourselves by the members of Christ's body could not be acceptable to God unless taken up into the offering of himself by Christ in consecration and communion. What Christ did was to invite us now to join him on that journey, on that we, in every Mass, join in Christ's journey from the Last Supper to death and resurrection, getting our priorities right.